Welcome to Hot Chips 25. Session 5. FPGA-based data flow. Hi, I'm Tom McWilliams. I'm the session chairman for this session. And the first speaker is uh, Michelle uh, Volta. She's a uh, re senior research scientist at Xilinx Labs in Dublin, heading a team of international researchers. Her key responsibility is for exploring FPAs and new market segments and investigating system architecture and emerging memory technologies for different application domains. She has a master's in computer science and electrical engineering. Um, from a um, university in uh, Germany. Um, uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Tom, for the introduction. Good morning to you all. I, I'm delighted to see that a few of you could be bothered to show up for the first session this morning. I appreciate that very much. Um, the, um, the presentation this morning is about one of my research projects that we've been working on for the last year and a half. Um, as such, it's a slightly different style of presentation to what you've seen yesterday. Uh, the topic of the research is the exploration of new um, architectures, data flow architectures for the implementation of key value stores, which are a fundamentally important function within data centers today. In fact, it's estimated that up to 30% of all servers and data centers run, run a key value store application. Let me get the pointer. Okay, so the aim behind using data flow architectures was to actually scale to the, the throughput of key value stores to higher levels. Current implementations are limited and it's very hard to actually get 10 gig line rate. So by using the data flow architectures, we aim to overcome this limitation. I've structured the talk into two parts. We'll start off with a general section on data flow, uh, sorry, on key value stores. I'll try to answer questions such as um, what are key value stores, what is the key functionality here, um, how are they currently implemented, and where are the limitations in these implementations. In the second section then, I'll dive into the data flow architectures. I'll try to shed some light into why we bothered with a data flow architecture and nothing else. Um, I will go in depth on the prototype architecture. Um, I will follow this up with some results that we have measured in our lab in Dublin. And uh, then I'll finish off with a discussion of the trade-offs, the drawbacks, and the limitations of this, because as you all know, nothing in this world comes for free, so you're not going to get exceptional performance for nothing. So I'll try to present what we think are the limitations of this implementation. So let's get started. Key value stores are um, a common middleware application in data centers which are used to alleviate access bottlenecks on databases. As such, the key value stores, as you can see on the slides, are placed between the tier of web servers and the database tiers where they're caching the most popular and the most recent content from the database. The key value stores are typically implemented with box standard x86 servers and um, they, in essence, provide the abstraction of uh, what you could call an associative memory. You could also call it a hash table or a CAM. It, uh, it really solves the lookup problem. As, as such, the values are stored and retrieved um, by sending an associated key rather than an address with your standard memory. And uh, because of that, your typical operations, the basic operations that you execute here are a set and a get. The set writes a pair of key and value into the store, whereas the get retrieves a value on the basis of its associated key. The most commonly used open source package for uh, key value stores is Memcached, and the prototype that I present to you today is, in fact, a Memcached compliant implementation. 
The typical implementations, as I just uh, said on the first slide, is a, is a standard x86, right, uh, that, you, that, uh, that you use in conjunction with a 10 gig network adapter. On the software side, I think there's a couple of things which are important to understand. Um, so everything in, uh, in the software, it's, it's multi-threaded, evolves around uh, a connection, which is re represented in a struct, and any event on the connection state is then distributed to, to the p-threads via, via libevent. All worker threads execute the same code. You can see that on the slide on the left-hand side. Um, whereby the main function that they run is called drive machine. Drive machine is uh, nothing but a, but a loop over a gigantic switch statement, which switches over the, the connection state. So the, the thread is woken up basically when there is a, a change in the connection state, then processes uh, that connection up to the next stage and hands off again. And the last thing that I want to point out about the software, there is a number of shared data structures between these threads. Um, most importantly, the, the sockets for the network connection, also the hash table, and uh, areas of the value store, even individual items. And these are protected by logs. So I think those are the most important things that you need to understand about the software implementation of Memcached. So, Let's take a quick look what you can achieve with, with today's x86. Um, the best number that we have found, it was published by Intel in the end of 2012, uh, is a Memcached compliant implementation on an Intel Xeon processor, single socket with eight cores, and this, this implementation achieves 1.34 million requests per second. And it serves those, um, that performance with a latency of 200 to 300 microseconds, roughly speaking. And the last metric that you often see quoted is the power efficiency. Um, this implementation uh, can service 7,000 requests per second per watt. There's recently a lot of research going on in how to implement Memcached with alternative architectures, and I've, I have some of those on the slides here. However, the, the, the one that we are comparing ourselves to is the first one, because that's the only one that is still compliant with the standard implementations. Um, actually, as a matter of fact, uh, there's uh, going to be in the, I think the, the second talk after this is actually going to be yet another alternative implementation of Memcached. So when you look at these numbers, 1.4 million requests per second, um, that's a long, long stretch away from what a 10 gig Ethernet link can deliver to you. So the key question is, what is what's the problem, right? Why can we not scale to the full 10 gig line rate? And there's a, a number of issues here. So we've done a, a bit of software profiling in our lab, um, but there is a much more thorough study that I would like to reference here that was published in a, in a really great paper this year at ISCA. I, I would, if you're interested in the subject matter, I really recommend a read of that paper. It does a nice job of quantifying the, um, the, the limitations that you have in the x86 architecture. And uh, the other thing I'd like to say at this stage is, um, I, um, I confess I'm slightly nervous about talking about the limitations of x86 processors in an audience of, of computer architects from Intel, IBM, and et cetera, et cetera. So please don't beat me up afterwards. <laughs> so, um, so what we perceive to be the, the issues with the x86 architecture are as follows. So the first problem is actually not Memcached, but it's actually TCP IP. And TCP IP has some, some nasty characteristics, and I'm sure you've, you yourself came across them at some stage uh, in, in, in your work. The first one is the TCP IP stack is CPU intensive. And I can il illustrate that very easily with the screenshot that you see at the top left uh, site here. Um, we took that when we were running four memcached server instances on, on our x86, and it's simple. Um, there's 113% of 800% of CPU cycles is running on, on, the, on the system space. There's a total of 45 only on, on the user space. So TCP IP takes a lot of cycles. The, the second problem with TCP IP, and you can see that also from the screenshot, is it's really interrupt intensive. And interrupts are bad in a number of ways. Um, first of all, it leads to a really high rate of instruction cache misses. 
which was quantified in the ISCA paper to produce 160 misses per 1,000 instructions. So that's a lot. So that, uh, tends, uh, that, that hints that the instruction cache on your x86 is not, not large enough. Um, so what, uh, what you heard yesterday at the IBM presentation on the Power 8 uh, with these supersized caches, that's a really great idea in this, this use case. The second problem is these frequent interrupts cause uh, poor branch predictability, which uh, result in stalls in the superscalar uh, pipelines of the x86. We've measured with VTunes, we get 2.5 clocks per instruction, which is really high, right? So you know, ideally you would, would like to have 0 0.25 for a four-way superscalar pipeline. And uh, if that wasn't bad enough, on top of that, the TCP IP stack creates a really high latency. So the lessons that we took away from this was, well, first of all, the TCP IP stack and the application, you want to minimize any resource sharing because the TCP IP stack can be really disruptive. And the second problem, uh, the second thing we learned from this, that we want to have a really close integration of network compute and memory to minimize the latency. The second problem with the x86 implementations is that the threads stall on memory locks, so you get synchronization overhead. Again, you have large locks that effectively serialize the execution, thereby you lose the benefits of data parallelism. Um, secondly, you run into synchronization rises, which cause poor branch predictability, and with that again, end up in an inefficient use of the superscalar pay pipelines. And that's, in fact, what uh, the Intel tech report from 2012 has addressed. So they improved the granularity of the looks, the, the locks to improve the performance. And with that, they got from 200,000 to 1.4 million requests per second. And now they are stuck on the other bottlenecks. Um, and the last problem that I want to mention is the layer three catch, which is uh, fairly ineffective due to the random access nature of the application. Um, again, the ISCA paper puts a number to this, which is between 60 to 95% of misses, which is very high. Um, that means that your multi-threading can't effectively hide the memory access latency. And on top of that, I mean, when you look at the pictures, the L3 cache consumes maybe a quarter, maybe a third of your die area, so that le leads to a lot of power waste. So for us, it meant we were going to explore instruction level parallelism with a data flow architecture rather than data parallelism. Um, we use static memory access to minimize desynchronization and arbitration overheads, and we won't bother with data caching. So that's the end of the general section, so let's talk about the data flow architecture. Um, so some of you might wonder why did we pick a data flow architecture? There's a lot of research, for example, going into microservers and, and their usage for memcached. We thought data flow architectures might be a good idea here because in essence, memcached is a streaming application. So when you look at it, you take data off the network, you stream it into the memory and back out, and on the way you have actually very little compute. So all you do is you parse packets, you hash, you do a lookup, you read or write a value store, and then format a packet and send it back out. And we know, right, that data flow architectures work really well for streaming applications and give you high throughput and very little power consumption. That's why we thought it's worth exploring this. This is the system architecture that we've implemented. You can see there's a network adapter with the 10 gig interface. We stuck a really nice big FPGA next to the 10 gig interface and attached a lot of DRAM to it. The whole thing is hosted in a workstation, which is, by the way, from Maxler. So you're going to hear a lot more about the Maxler development system in the next presentation. And um, on the host system, you have a standard x86, which in our scenario does actually very little. So the key things that you see here is close integration between network compute and DRAM, the data flow architectures to implement memcached on the FPGA. Um, what am I forgetting? Um, and, and, yeah, and, and a completely separate implementation of the TCP IP stack, which doesn't share resources with the application. So I think those are the key points on the system level architecture. And that's probably the most interesting slide that I have for you today that shows you how the data flow architecture works for memcached. 
I tried to illustrate its functionality by taking you through the life of a packet in this architecture. So we start off with the network that comes off the network, hits the FPGA, and first is being processed by a UDP or a TCP offload engine. This, this part of the design basically handles layer one and layer four of the protocol stack, and then only par, uh, passes the memcached part of the packet into the memcached processing pipeline. So you can see the red box going into the memcached pipeline. So the first stage of the processing is the request parser, which extracts the key, the value if it's present, and some metadata from the packet. And it passes this out on a standardized interface. It can do binary, it can do ASCII protocol, it hides the complete complexity of the protocol away from the rest of the pipeline. So this goes out from the request parser now to the hash table. The hash table will take the key and compute the hash over the key, and then that results in the address for the hash table. So from the hash table we then read, which is in, in essence the address in the value store where I can write or read my, my value from. So the, the address is merged into the metadata and passed onto the value store. The value store then takes the address and in case of a um, get operation, reads at that location the value from the value store. So that's what, what I've animated on this slide. In case of a set operation, it would be the inverse. The value is then merged inside the packet and passed onto the response formatter. The response formatter will, will encapsulate this and compose a nice uh, memcached packet, which is then passed to the UDP TCP offload engines, and from there it goes back out onto the network. Um, so this is one packet going through, but what happens in real life, of course, is that there are many packets concurrently being processed in their pipeline. They're basically marching back to back through that pipeline. There can be, in fact, up to 23 packets that reside just in that memcached part of the pipeline. So by that, we can fully exploit the instruction level parallelism and achieve a very high throughput with the architecture. The second thing here to notice is it takes 481 clock cycles for a packet for the first byte of the packet come in and the first byte of the packet going out. So 481 clock cycles at 156 megahertz, which is really dog slow. And if you compare that now to your standard x86, you would use somewhere between half a million to a million clock cycles at two gigahertz. And when you think about that, that will instantaneously explain to you why this architecture will give you much lower latency. And on top of that, it's going to be much more power efficient because you're only clocking 481 times. And then the last thing to notice about this is that that architecture is inherently scalable. So currently it's a 64-bit uh, wide um, data path. There is nothing that would prevent you from, from widening that data path to achieve a higher throughput. And on top of that, of course, you could clock it up a little bit as well. So I would be shocked if you couldn't uh, generate an 80 gig pipeline with this design. Um, to go just in a little bit more depth on the hash table, um, the hash table does collision handling by, by using a, a bucket size of eight. It does a parallel lookup in the memory, and we support flexible key sizes by striping them over me multiple memory locations. Um, that's a design trade-off. We're basically throwing memory bandwidth at the problem to reduce the probability of collisions. And we're, we're throwing storage efficiency and in, in order to support the flexibility of handling uh, different key sizes. Is that a good idea? I don't know, but uh, we thought you can achieve reasonable results with this. I'm, I'm no doubt that there's many different ways uh, to implement this. However, with this um, uh, work, we achieved a hash table with two million entries in less than 400 megabytes. It can support up to 168 byte keys, which is covering more the most common key value store use cases. And we managed with that a 23.6 gigabyte of value store, which could be easily scaled to higher numbers. So now we're going to move on to, to some of the results that we've measured in the lab. Um, first of all, how did we, we get at the results? We started off with a standard x86 memcached server and a standard x86 memcached uh, test client. There's a couple we, we ran, and we just reproduced standard performance results, and it did, uh, did a bit of software profiling. 
Then we built up our memcached server. Now, it took a little bit longer than that, but we used it then and, and run um, a, a validation that were actually compliant with the standard memcached test clients. And once we had that, we found very quickly that the x86 isn't fast enough to performance test the FPGA implementation, in which case we swapped over to a Spirant network tester that allows us really to hammer uh, the FPGA then with packets. We also used the NetFPGA Tenji, which is just another FPGA board for getting accurate latency measurements of our design. For, for power measurement, we just used the power meter at the wall plug and measured out the whole system. This is what it looks like in the lab on a, on a, on a clean day. And um, I don't think I need to go into detail here. Okay, and this is what we were uh, really excited about. So this slide shows you the performance that we've achieved. The um, x-axis is the packet size that's coming in, and the y-axis is the request per second that we can service. So. Um, the red line that you see is the absolute maximum throughput you can get on a 10 gig Ethernet link. So um, it's, it's decreasing because with larger packet size, your frame per second rate will naturally drop off. Um, the, we're, we're very happy to see that the FPGA performance is completely saturating the network and sits identical on the theoretical maximum. The x86 performance is the orange line with the, with the dots. Um, if you remember, it's 1.4 million requests per second, and, and it's, it's relatively flat because the overhead that you have per packet is, is very high. So that, that curve is going to hit at some stage the theoretical maximum performance that you're going to get from the network, and that's the stage where the x86 will saturate the, the, the 10 gig Ethernet link, and then it drops off of that as well. So the, the first result is we can, we can achieve sustained line rate processing for 10 gig Ethernet, so with up to 13 million requests per second in comparison to the 1.4 million that you get with your x86. In terms of power efficiencies, I've quoted two numbers there. You see the bottom two numbers, the 106 uh, requests per second per, per watt is the number when we take the power of the whole workstation into account. Um, that's a good number, but I would say that's probably far too conservative because the x86 on that host system is basically not utilized. I mean, it's, it uses less than 3% of one of the eight cores. So you could easily argue, well, this is actually a job for ARM processor that's integrated inside the FPGA, something like the, the current sync platform. In which case, the much more realistic number is to quote just the number for the FPGA subsystem, which would be then 255,000 requests per second per watt, which is substantially higher than the x86. And uh, finally, um, all of this is done with, with a very low latency, which won't surprise you after, after you see now the architecture. So we're looking at 3.5 to 4.5 microseconds, um, depending on packet size. Okay, I said at the beginning, uh, nothing in this world comes for free, so what is the key cost or the, the drawback of the FPGA design? And what we think in our eyes, it's because it's a hardware development effort. So you deal with a much larger complexity than you would do when you do a software development. Um, we try to illustrate this on a graph, and this is what we come up with. It's not exact, it's just... Uh, qualitative, okay. Um, so you have on the x-axis the development time, y-axis you have the performance. And with the x86 what happens, you get very quickly your functionality together, but the performance is somewhat limited. And then you spend a bit of time, so that's the lower left-hand corner blue dot there. And then you spend a bit of time and you improve your, your software and you scale up the performance, but it's going to hit an inherent limitation in the x86, and you're not going to go beyond that. Now, with the FPGA, what you do, you build the perfect architecture for, for your application, and you get wonderful performance, but you have a much larger development effort. And the $1 million question is, well, how can you bring that dot a little bit further to the left-hand side. And the way we're trying to address is by using high-level synthesis. And we started this half a year ago. We were recoding the entire MemGashD pipeline with a C-based design flow for FPGAs. And uh, I can't present the results yet, but it's looking really promising. So the question is, how far is that dot really going to come in? 
Other limitations that we see are um, the number of sessions that the TCP offload can support. That's a typical limitation for third-party IP for FPGAs. Again, that's something we're investigating now in the labs to see how we can build that on FPGAs. Second, limited storage capacity, and I'm not talking about the 10 gig line rate. I'm talking about, remember how I said we can scale this design to 80 gig, uh, but Scaling the, the amount of DRAM you can attach to the FPGA is going to be limited by the, the number of IOs. So here we're looking at SSDs because of an SSD I can connect you know, half a terabyte with two pins, whereas DRAM takes 150 IO pins for 8 gig. So that's another big subject for us. And the last one is we're very limited in terms of, I mean, it's a prototype. We've taken shortcuts when it comes to memory allocation, cache management, full protocol support, collision handling up to a level of eight. And that is really, you can do that in an FPGA, no doubt. But is it a good idea? Not so sure, right? Because they are not performance critical. So what you really want to do is explore hybrid architectures that combine ARM cores with FPGA fabric. And that's something we want to do in the future. Well, with that, I'm uh, at the end of the presentation. So I think the, the key message from this presentation is that data flow architectures allow you to, to sustain 10 gig line rate processing for key value stores. And they do that with a much better uh, power efficiency and with a much lower latency. The, the cost of this is a much larger development effort, which we try to attach by, uh, address by using high-level synthesis. And as next steps, we will um, address the limitations that uh, I just showed on the previous slide. And we're really interested in now trying this with real use cases to see um, what are the system level impacts uh, that we're generating with such an appliance. Okay, so with that, I'm at the end. Thank you so much for your attention, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, Hiraki, University of Tokyo. So I want to know that uh, why you call this data flow not the pipeline architecture? It's the same thing. Yes. Sarah Good, Duncan. That's very nice. Thank you. What's the, is there any, uh, Gary Flame over the Adventist. What is the, um, is there any critical nature between the, the memory and the FPGA as far as uh, tightly coupled or is it, is it standard? Is it a standard? It? It's, it's a standard sodium is attached to the FPGA. So you're back to the memory wall again, therefore yes. your comment about the SSD having, a, having fewer that, pieces. That's right. Memory. So with, with 10 gig, right, we can attach a lot of, of memory with current device generations, right? This is not a problem, but at 80 gig, um, and it's actually not so much the memory bandwidth, it's, uh, in the, it's the density, really, that you can attach effectively to the FPGA. Hi, Alan Cantle, Nalatech. Uh, excellent presentation. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, can you comment on, from a TCP IP perspective, the out-of-order packets and what the challenges of, it, of that? Is there, or did, doesn't that cause an issue in this? So the TCP IP implementation, that is something I'm going to refer to, to Maxwell because it's a piece of third party IP. And, and um, the problem with TCP IP is when you look in more detail is, is um, that for every session there is state that you keep, need to keep with the session. That's one of the problems, right? And uh, for if you have to sustain a large number of sessions, you have to move that off chip. And the second problem is that TCP IP is interrupted driven, so you have a lot of interrupts that trigger the transmit of a packet, right? You can have a, a packet coming in that you need to acknowledge. It could be that the application wants to send something. You could have a timeout that you actually have to retransmit a packet because you did. So it's, it's, it's a complex problem. And, and um, I think there, there's good ways of implementing that on FPGAs. It hasn't been done uh, at the moment because the, the key motivation for TCP IP offload comes from the high frequency trading, which doesn't need a high session count and is much more on low latency. So. And, and well, to that point, does that, uh, that obviously plays against the latency. Uh, so you've got the 480 clock cycles, but if, if the packet retries or could really slow things down significantly, I guess. That's true. There's TCP IP overhead, which is really beyond the, the Memcached. 
You've not counted that, I guess, in obviously. In the no, the 481 include the, uh, the TCP IP. Okay. So there's there's actually of the 481, 189 only are the memcached. The rest is all TCP IP. And, and just coming back there to the first point is you have um, some overhead, but uh, when, when you have retransmit, but once you've established the session, then, uh, then actually the packets will go back to back. Um, Mark Horowitz, Stanford University. Uh, Mark, I, I'm out of time. Oh, out of time. Okay. You can talk well, to me afterwards. Yeah, thanks. Um, let's see, the next, next talk is coming up on going to the wire. Um, and uh, Artie uh, Stutzner is going to start off, and he's um, is the Managing Director of Platform Development at CME, CME Group. In this role, Art, Artie uh, works with various divisions across CME Group, including clearing operations, products and services, and technology to develop and implement client-focused technology. Artie reports to the Chief Operating Officer. Thank you very much for the introduction. CME Group is honored to be able to be here today to be talking to you, especially talking to you with Max Seller. CME Group is one of the largest exchanges in the world, and we are actually one of the leading global exchanges in the world. Our platforms process and be able to manage price discovery as well as clearing risk management globally for products you probably know. For many of you standing here where your main purpose is driving technology, um, we're not insulted at all if you don't know who we are. The Economist recently wrote an article calling us the largest exchange that nobody has ever heard of. We're here to be able to talk to you about some of the challenges we have and the help that we need from you to be able to drive innovations for ourselves. As an applied technology company, we use your technology to be able to solve business problems that we have. As you can see in front of you as a global exchange and one that trades 24 hours a day, six days a week, we have significant challenges in being able to keep up with not only the flows, but also the expectations of a global marketplace. Not only do we have a global footprint where almost 30% of our transactions occur outside of US hours, we also have partnered with premier exchanges globally like BMNF, Bavespa in South America, like the Korean exchange in Korea as well as the Japan exchange to be able to not only drive globalization but to be able to support global risk management. And I can appreciate when we say risk management that probably means something very different for you than it does for us. I would welcome anyone who has a, a tablet or a computer to be able to pull up cmegroup.com and be able to look at the vast products that we trade. As you can see in front of you, essentially you name a product, we trade it. Whether it's interest rates, commodities, energy, equities, we not only have a footprint within the US, but we have a footprint globally. Whether you want to trade the Nikkei, the Nifty 50, the S&P 500, whether you want to trade WTI or Brent futures, or even if you'd like to speculate on gold, you can do that on CME Group. One of the interesting challenges that has presented us with the industry is the electronification of our markets. Back in 2000, as you can see, we averaged roughly 800,000 contracts a day. But thanks to electronification and the scale that electronification presents, along with a series of vertical mergers that have occurred between CME, CBOT, and NYMEX, we've been able to grow essentially exponentially, growing from roughly 800,000 contracts a day in the early 80s to be able to average over 12 million contracts a day. And when you look at it, and I don't think anything here will surprise you, we're living in an era of convergence. When you look at just around the room, whether it's the convergence of mobility along with the availability of network and internet, whether it's infrastructure and the opportunity to be able to put services that before required a computer now into the cloud and be available everywhere, we're living in an era of convergence. And financial services is no different. And we're essentially focused on two areas. 
One is on the training side, we're very focused on risk management. And for us, risk management really represents the opportunities for firms to be able to manage how much risk their customers are taking on when they're trading. Additionally, thanks to recent regulation, there's a convergence on the clearing side, where no longer is there a concept of over-the-counter versus exchange traded. Now all of that is being pooled together in central counterparty clearing. And all of that presents huge opportunities for us as an applied technology company to be able to leverage your insights, your innovation, to be able to help to solve our business problems. As we look ahead towards the future, there's really critical needs we have as an exchange to be able to power better solutions for our customers. And the biggest challenges we're having today is being able to maintain the scalability and performance that our customers expect while providing greater functionality, greater risk management, and of course being able to do that with a reasonable total cost of ownership and a reasonable efficiency. While servers and chips have gotten cheaper and cheaper, the cost of the network, the stack, the cooling, the physical real estate itself has simply been going up exponentially. So we're at the point now where we can't simply afford just to throw thousands of servers on a grid to be able to solve a problem. We really need efficiency. And not only do we need efficiency, we need raw throughput to be able to manage that problem. So as we look ahead, as you can see in the graph in front of you, um, and, and the, um, the y-axis is in millions, and the x-axis represents a, a time scale, uh, many people think that in, in 2008, when we had the, uh, the financial recession, and although our, certainly our financial volumes dropped as a result of it, as you can see, our order volumes have simply increased, and they've been increasing at a linear rate, one could argue exponentially, depending upon how you model it. And for us, this, is, this doesn't represent a problem, it represents an opportunity. An opportunity for us to be able to figure out how to manage big data, an opportunity for us to figure out how to present more functionality for enhanced risk management, while being able to support the predictability and consistency that our trading segments expect. And for, not, for us, although high frequency gets a lot of press and is very easy to talk about, we're not here to represent high frequency. In fact, we're here to represent all of our customer segments that trade because that is something that all of our customers need as far as predictability and consistency to be able to handle this flow. As we look ahead towards the future, for us, DFEs, uh, data flow engines, represent a very exciting trend and a very exciting opportunity for us to be able to not only enhance the risk management that we provide, but be able to improve the consistency and predictability of our trading platforms. And with that, I'd, I'd like to hand it over to Oscar Menser, the founder and CEO of Max Seller. We're very excited to be able to work with Oscar and be able to enhance many of our risk management challenges. And one of the, the challenges that we had, and, and I think was very well uh, talked about in the earlier presentation from Xilinx, is the, the productivity issues of being able to leverage the predictability and consistency of FPGAs while being able to have the uh, standard software development lifecycle that software engineers expect. And for us, Maxeller is a unique opportunity to be able to get the advantages of data flow engines and the consistency and predictability of FPGAs along with enhanced risk management while minimizing the negatives as far as productivity as well as being able to get cost efficiencies out of it. So with that, I will hand it over to Oscar to talk a little bit about Max Seller and their technology. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ari. Um, it's a, a particular pleasure to be back, back here at Stanford uh, um, and to uh, tell you about the latest advances that we've made on uh, pushing the uh, data flow computing concept forward. Uh, you can see here, um, what uh, Ari was talking about, uh, in the finance industry, there is a very strong need for uh, performance, for uh, latency, uh, uh, for throughput, and then just generally uh, a optimization of total cost of ownership. And um, the results that we have here 
shall we cross not just trading, but also uh, the exchange environment where you have uh, the matching of uh, bids and offers, uh, the streaming of uh, big data sources, so there is data that needs to go around, and, um, and just generally the optimization of efficiency of the environment where the financial system today is essentially a computer system. The people have been replaced with computers and the efficiency of these computers drives the value and the prices of things very directly. And so this is a very nice substrate for us to demonstrate the technology and have a fair evaluation of what the actual advantage is of uh, doing the Maxeller style data flow computing that, that we've been uh, uh, proposing for quite a while now. And, and so that maybe ties into one of the questions that, that was uh, asked for the previous talk. And, and so our perspective on what the difference is between data flow and pipelining is very different, um, especially uh, if you look at it from uh, the stack that we've built up, and, and you can see this here, um, the data flow machine paradigm that we've developed and the programming model that we've developed on top of that enable us to do things like TCP IP and like the solving of partial differential equations and transaction processing at absolute minimal latency and maximum throughput. And it's, it's a machine model that enables a programming model on top of that that then allows you to program it easily. So you cannot just have a programming model in a vacuum, right? You require a programming mod uh, model on top of a machine model. And it's that combination that, that allows this. So if you look at this, it's a combination of data flow and control flow where you might want to think about this in the context of a decoupled architecture. And so in networking, we already know decoupling of the control plane from the data plane has been a major impact recently. The whole industry is in turmoil because of what that means. And, and uh, of course, uh, we've been all tracking the, the software-defined networking activity for a while now. And we can do the same thing for computing by taking the control plane, control flow processors, microprocessors, in our case, we would be using uh, standard server processors, and uh, creating a data flow machine model parallel to that, decoupled from it, where you program the two sides separately. And by doing that, creating the efficiency. So, so what we do here is creating the machine model and, and the hardware, and then putting software stacks on top, and it turns out it's not as easy as it seems. You need to put whole platforms on top of that. So, so you require uh, operating system things, but then there is software platforms on top. And so what we've expanded to do is to deliver the entire analytics software on top of that platform, which we are running now uh, with the CME group, um, to run risk scenarios. What does that mean for, for a computer architect? It's basically solving partial differential equations. It's floating point, right? So floating point computations, large scale solvers, large amounts of data, you have multi-dimensional data sets that you have to rotate through a PDE solver and combine that with transaction processing because we are in an exchange, there's transactions happening. You have a TCP IP stack, you have trades coming in, you have acknowledgements coming out or sometimes rejections because maybe the guy doesn't have the money to buy the thing, right? And so there's a security issue, there is a checking issue, there is a deep packet inspection issue if you want from a from a computer systems perspective, where everything has to happen as quickly as possible, and we are talking one to two microseconds today in order to do the whole thing. Request for a trade comes in, risk computation, PDE solving. You need to decide if the guy has money in the bank. You need to send it off to the exchange. You get the reply back, you send it back to the guy. And if you get all of that wrong anywhere, of course, quite bad things can happen and people get quite upset. So getting it right, but also getting it as efficient as possible has then an impact on the price of an actual commodity. Because the cost of doing that, the time it takes you to do it, makes the market, it creates the value that, that sits behind that. And, and we'll see later on, the key component of that is not just the latency, it's not the fact that it takes one or three microseconds. It's the fact that every single time 
it will take the same amount of time. It is consistent. Packet comes in, packet goes out. Every time that happens, there is no interrupts, there is no dynamic events, there is no uh, unforeseen activity, there is no other thing that the processor could be deciding to do because it needs to flush something or, or something fills up. It's just consistently doing the same thing over and over again. And that consistency has a lot of value in this environment. Um, from a programming uh, perspective, uh, this is uh, our uh, data flow programming environment. So the programming, as I said, is enabled by the data flow paradigm that we have developed. It's not a generic everybody's data flow paradigm. It's a particular one that, that we've put together uh, that enables the easy programming from a high level language. And uh, from our perspective, this is, this is as different from high level synthesis as it possibly could be. So high-level synthesis, from our perspective, really doesn't solve programming. It's still synthesis. And as long as you call it synthesis, you're going to have electrical engineers thinking about transistors. So what we are doing here is we have a programming environment that is being used by not even computer scientists, but by people who work in an exchange writing uh, source code for the finance industry who barely have a little bit of programming experience, being able to write one or two microsecond turnaround programs inside of a network that, that do this. So this is the decoupled architecture where you have the data flow code on the right, you have the CPU code on the left, and you have what we call a manager in the middle. And this is all part of Maxeller uh, IDE which uh, we put together so you can write all of these things in the same environment and you can push buttons and simulate these things. And, and view them uh, and debug them and then just make sure that, that they come out right without having to know anything about FPGAs, the underlying technology, or what it means to, to do a TCP IP stack. Uh, there is a lot more behind this, and uh, I've given a talk here at Stanford in January uh, that basically is a zoom in on this particular slide, so I won't repeat that. Uh, but if you Google for EE380 uh, and then you look for January, you will find uh, a whole hour of discussion of how that works with the pipelines and uh, with creating the machine model and, and how we program these and then create the data flow graphs that you see on, on the left here. Um, this slide is uh, about the partial differential equations that need to be solved for the risk management. And so here you look at uh, the finance uh, assets that, that Ari was alluding to. Um, and you have European options, American options, European options, and they all have a partial differential equation, which is the model. That model is used to calculate price and risk for that particular derivative. And you can see the, the measured results that we have for computing per cubic foot. So these are numbers where we compare computations per cubic foot in the data center, which is not the standard way of comparing computers. And it's not necessarily acknowledged as a useful thing. So we don't compare chip by chip. We don't compare bus by bus. We don't compare card by card. We take a cubic foot in the data center. We say, what can you do inside of that cubic foot? OK, it's not a cubic foot. It's a one use server uh, and whatever that volume ends up being. So we say, it's, it's fair game, you, everybody gets the same space, what can you do inside of that? And with the latest and greatest Intel CPUs and the best compilers and really optimized software, uh, you get the performance here of uh, um, uh, being able to compute 35,544,000 uh, European swaption pricings. And in the same amount of time, you can do 848,000 on a CPU node. So that's a 42x. Now, there's corner cases where that ends up being a little bit less. And there's corner cases where that ends up being a little bit more. But funnily enough, we always end up between somewhere between 20 to 50. And so there seems to be some kind of physical component of energy dissipation and efficiency that we are hitting uh, across oil and gas, finance, uh, physics, chemistry, all the different applications that we've done over the years, uh, latency, uh, memory bound applications, uh, compute bound applications, IO bound applications, uh, we typically end up in the same ballpark. 
So here's a lot more detail on, on how a uh, risk engine works. We don't really have enough time here to get into this, but there is Monte Carlo simulations. There is uh, other PDE solving mechanisms in there. Um, and, and then just how the data goes in, in terms of market data, the client data, the trade data, the, the data that the exchange has locally, and then the results that need to be spit out in terms of risk and pricing numbers, basically something that enables you to do scenario analysis on the back end and real-time trading risk as you're, you're doing it in the, in the pipeline. Um, some kind of structure here where, where you have the analytics that we've developed on top of the data flow, on top of the underlying hardware that you're building, uh, with Maxeller OS, with the analytics, wrapped into an entire financial system uh, that, that does all of these computations sitting inside of an actual hardware system where uh, we've put together the TCP IP bits. You can see the fast and fixed, these are exchange protocols. So there is now a data flow programming environment. There's also a protocol programming environment as part of this, which allows you to write any kind of network protocols. And so there's TCP IP, there's all the exchange protocols. These are all coded in Java in our high-level programming environment, and they're running inside of FPGAs as circuits. And the people who've programmed them have no idea about FPGAs or even data flow for the matter. So it's really just a programming model on top, which allows us to write these things fairly quickly, integrate all of this, and run all of that in hardware at static speeds that we can predict. And once you do that, uh, you get a system like this where you can feed through the, um, the packet. So packet comes in, packet goes out, and you can give somebody a little window where they program a few lines of Java code that go right, right in here in the middle. That could be your trading strategy, or that could be your credit check. That could be the way that you're checking if the guy has actual money in the bank. And then just a few lines of code, you push a button, it compiles the whole thing, and it executes in hardware. There's a little bit of detail on how that works. I won't get into this too much, but you can see here uh, there is a TTL field, for example, in a packet, and all you need to do is to say you want the TTL field, and then you just get it, and then you subtract one from it, and you concatenate it back into the packet and you get it out. You notice this is all you have to write. While in the back end, there is, of course, a huge amount of effort needed to extract the field from a packet, put it back into that packet, and stream it out through TCP. There's a more complicated example here with a routing table and being able to extract different fields and feeding that through. Again, you see the code itself is, is fairly short and, and the amount of stuff it does is uh, fairly complex if you think about it from an RTL perspective or even high-level synthesis. Now you can combine that with the CPU. There is ways to stream things to the CPUs, to the memories, and you describe that by, by simple setting up streams between the different things. So you have the SFPs with the, with the Ethernet, PCI Express that gets you to the CPU. Uh, there is DRAM attached to all of this. And, and with simple stream commands, you, you just say, this has to go over there, this has to go over here. You need to worry about how it actually gets there. All the scheduling is being done statically by the compilation system, and then the dynamic bits, which is PCI Express, of course, and, and some of the DRAM stuff that has to be dynamic, is being done by Maxeller OS at runtime to, uh, to get all of these things scheduled properly. And then you can mix and match these. You write different kernels, and you put them together with this different TCP IP blocks. And that you're just describing in terms of, of blocks. You say this block, that block, this block, put them together, and describe how they're connected together. So there is a description of flow that you have to do here in order to, to get all of these things to work. Uh, now, we don't have much time, so I'll go through this quickly, where the flow of things is you write uh, the Max compiler uh, Java files, and you compile all of these. You, of course, have to run place and route tools for the FPGAs, and, and then you get the data flow uh, file that goes into the data flow engine to, to run the whole application. And, and then at runtime, um, you, you simply get a .o file, and, and you uh, actually still compile them. You compile it with the CPU, 
and compile, uh, compile it together with the Maxeller OS libraries, which at the end of the day are just .o files as well, and, and the device driver. Uh, and then you, you take these uh, Max files, and uh, you can either simulate them with a fast C++ simulation, or you run it in, in hardware. Uh, and that, that is fairly transparent to the user. It's just in Max ID, you push a button and you can select if you want to run it in software or, or in hardware. And, and the software here is, is uh, you know, not your model sim, but, but it's really more of a software simulation. So, so it's running a lot faster as a cycle accurate simulation. Now this is the slide that is actually the key slide. I only have 50 seconds, but this is really showing a measurement of latency of that whole computation. Pack it in, pack it out. Um, it, it always is 1.8 microseconds for this particular case that, that we've measured uh, on, on one environment. And for the CPU, of course, this graph looks like this, where, where you have a wide Gaussian curve. Of course, you have that curve at more like 100 microseconds or, or, for, or further out there. So, so that's, uh, that's kind of the key value on the predictability side where you can guarantee a service to a customer. You say, we guarantee to you it's going to be this long and you can actually sell that and they can measure it and it ends up being exactly that every single time. And so there is value in that predictability for some markets and in some environments that we are, uh, we are capturing here. Um, and so finally, this is the uh, current uh, product lineup. Thank you very much. Any questions? What? Oops. All right, well, thank you very much. Our next talk is also a, a talk on FPGA-based inline acceleration. Um, my, my Sam um, Lavasanit Lava, Lava um, is a PhD student at the University of Texas in Austin under supervision of Professor um, D. E. Park Chao. He is working on high-performance acceleration architectures focused on networking and data center applications. He's also interested in new programming models and compiler techniques to design and implement such accelerators. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. OK. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Maysam Lavasani, and today I want to talk about an FPGA-based inline accelerator for MemCached. Uh, I've done this work in cooperation with Harry Andrew and my advisor, Professor Derek Chu, in the University of Texas at Austin. But I think it's not a secret that architects now is facing two main challenges, one from higher level of abstraction due to changes in the applications, behavior, and workload, and the other one from underlying devices and transistors due to disruption in the NARS scaling. For example, for server class processors, we see that new applications like social cloud big data are becoming more and more popular. And also we see that power wall is already a limiting factor. And people in fact predict that, uh, you know, uh, both of these issues are causing in inefficiencies for the current architectures and uh, predict that this problem is going to be even ex exacerbated in the future and, be, and putting more and more cores are not going to buy us too much. So one uh, solution that uh, architects are, uh, are looking at in order to tackle both of these issues is using uh, specialized hardware, also known as accelerators. And we are also trying to accelerate server applications, uh, but we want to we do that using FPGAs or FPGA resources in order to provide both flexibility and uh, performance. So one of these you know, relatively popular applications in the used in many social networking sites is uh, memcached, which is a basically a distributed key value system. And it acts as the application level cache between the front end web servers and back end servers like database servers or 
uh, app servers. And the way it works is uh, whenever a web server wants to get the data from a database, for example, it first tries memcached. If memcached has the data, that will be a hit. And uh, that will be a fast access because memcached keeps everything in the memory. If uh, memcached does not have a data, that will be a miss. And web server is responsible to go get the data from the database itself and also on the side update the memcached for future uses. Well, if you look at the memcached protocol in more details, it is a relatively simple protocol, three major category of commands like update commands, retrieval commands, and remove commands. And uh, uh, basically, all, all the commands in these categories have got their different flavors and options. And I'm, I'm really showing a super simplified control flow graph of the uh, memcached over here. But uh, all these commands working pretty much like whenever a request comes from the client, it contains a key associated with the item of interest. And memcached goes and finds the item through a hash table and does the appropriate action, create a response to the client, and send it to a client. Well, one interesting characteristic in the real workloads of memcached is the fact that memcached is a uh, read-intensive workload. So um, uh, the, the, the uh, portion of retrieval requests, the total number of requests, are reported as high as 96%. So one might um, uh, think of like, you know, memcached needs, you know, high performance networking, high performance memory interfaces, and at least a class of FPGAs are good at uh, uh, both of these things. So why not get the memcached and put it on the FPGA and enjoy from specialization, basically? Well, the problem is, uh, even though memcached is relatively simple, uh, server application, it is still too complex to be implemented entirely with the support of full protocol and the hardware. Or at least if you do that, you're going to waste lots of hard hardware resources that can be used much more efficiently otherwise. And there is another problem, the second problem, which is uh, uh, dealing with application modifications and uh, fine tuning, something like memcached, especially in the big deployments requires lots of modifications. And uh, having a hardware design step for each of these modifications is really a big problem. So uh, one solution, at least for one of these, uh, the first problem, basically, is using a hybrid architecture, having both FPGA and general purpose hardware, and uh, basically implement the common case uh, handling part of the application on FPGA, and because that part requires much less hardware resources, probably uh, we are solving the first problem, running out of the hardware resources. But it's still the second problem is here, which is dealing with application modifications. So uh, in, in our recent paper in the computer architecture letters, uh, we introduced a technique called inline acceleration. And we are trying to solve both of these problems at the same time. Uh, and uh, basically, the rest of this presentation is about, uh, uh, is about uh, inline acceleration technique and applying this technique for the memcached application. So in a system with inline accelerator, we have all components we can find in an ordinary system like general purpose cores, coherent memory system, network interface card, except two important features. Uh, number one, NIC or network interface card is equipped with some FPGA resources. And number two, NIC is, has access to the coherent memory system the same way that other you know, general purpose cores have access. And uh, what we want to do, we want to implement a simple and yet fast version of the application on the FPGA side and whenever requests come, if it is a common case request, we want to process that using this FPGA and uh, probably access the global data structure of application. I want to emphasize that we, want, we, want, we don't want to touch the uh, data structure of the application. We, we don't want to change them, sorry. Uh, probably the hardware going to access the data structures through the coherent memory port 
and generate the response, send it to a client, and basically <clears throat> don't even bother the uh, general purpose core. So the important part is the way we generate this hardware, basically. And if, if you look at all the, uh, for example, high-end routers, this is, this is not a new technique, basically, this hybrid architecture. All, all high-end IP routers have got the split between the data plane and control plane. They process the common case things in the you know, network processors and just pass the exceptional packet to the control plane. But what we want to do, we want to generalize this technique and try to extract the data plane part of any arbitrary, at least, you know, with, with certain characteristics, any arbitrary applications to accelerate that. And what we do, we uh, basically uh, profile the application. And in the control flow graph of the application, we detect the hot basic blocks in the application, which are required to, to process the common case requ request. And we slice the application and extract the trace of these hot basic blocks. And we only synthesize this hot trace into the FPGA. Well, while we are processing a request, it might be the case that in any of these hot basic blocks, we jump out of the hot trace, we diverge from hot trace, and uh, it is completely intuitive that in that case, in fact, the request is not a common case request. And in that case, what we want to do, we want to uh, fall back to original NIC functionality, which is just passing the packet to original application on top of the general purpose core, and let the original application take care of these uncommon exceptional cases. Well, uh, and we call this process bailout process. I mean, falling back to NIC functionality. So things look good and simple, except that there is a problem here. We call it bailout issue. And the problem is, while we are processing the request, and before we notice that this is not a common case request, we might already updated some of the global data structure of the application. And uh, we, we, we should somehow transfer the computation to the slow path in a safe way, basically. I mean, there are several solutions to these, but the solution we took for memcached case is uh, we, uh, we require the programmer to give us a user-defined rollback routine to basically clean up the mess that FastPath probably done on the global data structures. You might say that, okay, you were supposed to cut the you know, programming efforts, but we have got evidence that you know, uh, writing the rollback code is uh, uh, pretty much simple for many server applications. And in fact, many server, in fact, there is a class of server applications that they already have the rollback mechanism. They use it for different purpose, for example, transactional databases. They use it for different purpose. They use it for uh, resolving the conflicts between conflicting transactions, but one might use the same mechanism to write the rollback for the transfer of computation between the fast path and the general purpose core. But Memcache is not, is not like that. It doesn't have the rollback mechanism by itself. But still, because of the atom, atomicity characteristic for processing the request, rollback code was super simple, only 30 lines of code. So if we have an application with three, uh, uh, three main characteristics, if the application have a, a small hot trace of instructions, because we want to fit it on the FPGA. An application is rollback friendly, we just talked about it. And the third characteristic is application should have a threading model that uh, every request comes should be processed from the beginning to the end by a single thread. And this is the restriction by, because of uh, you know, HLS implementation, because of the HLS tool we have. If we have application with these three characteristics, our slicer tools that we wrote using uh, Valgrind and LLVM, uh, a sliced application, it extracts the hot trace. There is a manual step here, which is you know, writing the rollback code and annotating some memory types in order to make, to make life easier for the programmer, sorry, for the HLS tool. And uh, uh, for example, we need to annotate Memory is like, this is a packet IO memory, this is a global memory, this is a private memory. And we pass 
the whole thing, hot trace plus the rollback routine to our template-based HLS tool, uh, and we generate the Verilog code. And the uh, Verilog code can, can be uh, synthesized into the hardware later. So if you're interested in this template-based HLS tool, uh, please have a look at our FPGA 2012 paper. We give more details on these over there. But basically what it does is it, it pays special attention to the fact that we are processing the packets and you know, it tries to schedule as much operation it can to make you know, uh, wide instructions in the FPGA. And also it has features to make parallelism like you know, pipelining, multi-threading, and uh, multiple engines. So um, even though we have a step here, which is a manual programming step, we believe that uh, this, the amount of effort for doing this programming is much less than you know, designing the hardware manually or even using conventional HLS tools. And I think, I mean, Max Seller, uh, I uh, forgot the uh, presenter but name, but the, he, he mentioned a very important point that, it, that you know, not only the effort is less than the programming for, for the hardware design, but you don't need the knowledge of the hardware design at all. So you might need to understand the application, roll back the application, on reasoning about concurrency, but no, no need for hardware knowledge, basically. So we applied this method for, uh, you know, memcached. And uh, memcached originally is something like 10,687 lines of code. And it has the threading model that we're looking for. Because, of, because it's using lib event library. And a slicer tool, it's not, it's not a wonder that you know, a slicer tool extract a hot trace that is basically uh, almost all get operations, not all get operations, but almost all get operations, except some exceptional cases, like when you hit the uh, item which is expired. And the uh, hot routines, the routines that involve in the uh, uh, hot trace is only 963 lines of code in the original memcached. And most surprising is the fact that the hot instructions, the static instructions uh, in the hot trace is less than 2,000 instructions. Basically, we need to build a hardware which is just equivalent to 2,000 2, static instructions, x86 static instructions. And, uh, you know, rollback code is very simple. The amount of memory annotations is not very much. And we pass the whole thing to our uh, uh, HLS tool. And the hardware is something like 57 complex states. And these complex states, as I mentioned, they're, they're really heavy operations. They're really like a very wide VLIW instructions. And for example, parsing IP UDP is taking only four steps. And uh, and uh, we generated the hardware for that. The hardware, the single engine hardware is taking something like 5% of FPGA resources on a Vertex 6 device with the clock cycle, best clock cycle of 7.3 nanoseconds. Well, um, we, um, we compared the performance of the generated hardware with the uh, best software impl implementation we know of, which is fi fine-tuned by, by Intel. I think Michel also used the same reference point. And, uh, and in this graph, what I'm showing is four different configurations, one Xeon core, two Xeon core, one accelerator engine, two accelerator engines. And uh, the important point, and the x-axis is the offered load to these hardwares. Y-axis is the sustained throughput. And uh, the, the interesting thing is, if you look at the, uh, if you compare one accelerator engine with one Xeon core, uh, one accelerator engine is, uh, uh, has got a throughput of 590,000 requests per second and only consuming one watt. Whereas a Xeon core requires eight watts in order to deliver 175,000 requests per second. 
This translates into 27x gap on the energy efficiency of these two hardware. And, uh, and this is the opportunity we got. I mean, this workload is the uh, fast path only workload. So we, we do not need to bail out. We do not need to uh, communicate with the slow path. And we are, just we are just considering the FPGA power here, which is not right. But this is the uh, upper bound for us to uh, get the performance out of this uh, architecture. So in order to uh, see the uh, effect of uh, you know, having inline accelerator in a, uh, in a system with both inline accelerator and general purpose hardware, we build an environment on top of the Gem5 simulator. And we are simulating the, uh, uh, both stack of client system as well as the server system on top of the Gem5. In these two systems are connected through the Ethernet. And uh, on the client side, we are running MC Blaster, a benchmark program for Memcached. On the server side, we are running the you know, uh, Memcached, original Memcached on top of the Alpha Core. However, we changed the NIC in the uh, server system, and we added the inline accelerator state machine to the NIC. And, uh, and uh, here's the throughput. The throughput, when we have some slow path operations among fast path operations, and uh, uh, x axis is basically the uh, different rate of slow path operations that we are injecting, and uh, y axis is again sustained throughput, and we, set, and we can see that when we inject some slow path operations among fast path operations, the performance degrades. And this is the bailout overhead, synchronization overhead, and co cache coherency overhead between these two. And uh, however, the hardware is still, the, the performance is still better than the Xeon core, uh, which is running only fast path operations in this case. And um, of course, the big win is the power, the, the difference between power of these two hardware. So now that we know the inline accelerator engine has, is much more energy efficient than you know, uh, uh, Xeon core, so we wanted to know that if we have it, uh, if we have an inline acceleration, if we add the inline acceleration support, for example, to the same Xeon processor that Intel used for the experiment, uh, for the experiment, uh, I don't know why do I have all these cell range over here, but um, anyhow, the uh, the um, this graph basically we projected the throughput versus power of a Xeon processor plus the inline accelerator. And these uh, uh, blue dots basically are uh, showing one, two, three, four in, uh, inline accelerator engines. And uh, these uh, uh, green triangles, I'm sorry for the bad you know, labels, uh, are showing one, two, four, eight, and 16 uh, Xeon cores, and these, these numbers are basically reported numbers by Intel. But what we can see here is, uh, uh, and, and we are assuming two things. We are assuming that inline accelerator has as much FPGA resources as the same Vertex 6 device we are talking about. And uh, also we are assuming that uh, when we are not using the Xeon cores, we can turn them off, we can power gate them. And in that case, you see the, uh, for, for the eight engine case, we see a 3.6x gap between the baseline Xeon solution, whereas the Xeon solution with the support of inline accelerator. Uh, well, to, to conclude, and I think um, I have, uh, uh, three more minutes, uh, we, we, we talked about a methodology for accelerating a class of server applications. And um, um, with the server application should have those three characteristics I was talking about. 
And uh, we, we showed a case study that energy efficiency can, can be improved with a factor of 3.6x. And we did this with little programming effort, basically. For future, we want to uh, improve our compiler uh, and uh, build a real system using these compiler and apply the methodology to other applications. Thank you very much. So if there is any question. Uh, <clears throat> now Nakamura Kurchips conference series. Uh, do you planning on uh, checking the memory DRAM uh, power consumption under your uh, CPU uh, memory no, no. cache systems? Sure, sure, sure. No, no. This uh, improvement is only on the processor. Yes. I do not include the yeah. DRAM power. Okay. You're a student, therefore I gave you the <laughs> subject to you to improve your research. Thank you. Sure. Good talk. Um, Thank you. Bob Safranek, Intel. Thank you. Uh, when you were do modeling your flows, mm -hmm. you, you have a picture of the, your accelerator being attached to, to the last little cache. Mm -hmm. and way back there. Uh, um, did you have, uh, were those more like uh, PCIe f uh, flows into, ca into the cache, or did you envision that to actually be like a, a caching agent, more of a, a core-like uh, interconnect there? Uh, <clears throat> so what I'm doing case. is, you know, I'm attaching the NIC to the cache directly, mm -hmm. like, uh, like any other core in the Gem 5. So uh, all cores got the, they, they own, you know, cache and, you know, the private cache is attached to the last level cache. And the same way, you know, Nick is attached to the, has got uh, one port to the, you know, last level cache. Okay. Did, did I answer your question correct? I think so. <laughs> okay. Sorry. okay, thank you very much. <laughs>